Well, this is the third, the third puzzle I made. The first one I made was when I was at school, and this was a dodecahedron. It's quite simple, with only a slight small locking device. And then later on I made an octahedron, which I regard as a bit of a failure. It was all right, but the solution depended on assembling things in a sliding way, which you didn't use the normal orthogonal motions that one has. Um, but that was about the only merit it had. And, uh, and then this one I made out of perspex. This is not my... It's, it's my design, exactly the same shape and size as the one I made, but mine was made out of transparent perspex. Makes it a bit more difficult because you can't quite see what's going on in perspex and which is a piece and which is the that, what was a hole in a piece or something. But anyway, I made it in, in Easter vacation, I think it was, with a uh, out of a, a hacksaw and a broken file, I believe, were the main ingredients I had to make it, and uh, and then I had to polish it up, and I took it with me to Cambridge, where I was a graduate student. And uh, there I, I encountered Frank Adams. I think I'd known Frank before. Probably I'd gone up to Cambridge anyway before I actually went as a student. And I knew he was interested in puzzles. And he, we sort of exchanged puzzles. He gave me his and I gave me, I lent him, we lent, uh, I lent him my three. Uh, the first two I think he was a bit scornful about. <laughs> the one I designed at school was, was a little too easy for him. And the octahedron didn't have any particular merits, but this one did impress him. <laughs> and it took him apparently five hours to do. Now it's it's really based on much sort of it it's got all these funny angles because it's a tetrahedron. But a tetrahedron, if you put it on its edge like this, you can see it sits inside a cube. In the cube and you sort of lop off every other corner and makes a little tetrahedron in the middle. So it's based on a cube and you have these cubic directions in the cube so things slide along the, the directions of a cube. So although the angles look funny when it's a tetrahedron, it's really in a base in essentially a cube puzzle. But it's not really because it depends upon the fact that when you cut the cube up or the cubic, um, what's it called? There's a name for this particular kind of puzzle, which just has six pieces arranged in, in a cube. They two go that way, two go this way, and two go the other way. And uh, you sort of slide them back, backwards and forwards and get the last piece in that way. Um, but uh, this is sort of like that, but because it's made into a tetrahedron, there's something new which you don't have with the cubic one because you you've, because you cut the, cut the pieces off in an angle. It means that as you slide a piece, certain angles uh, get in the way or get revealed. And the first, I had this, uh, the first move about getting it apart, like sliding this one sideways. And then that allows the next one to be pushed along the orthogonal cube directions. And when you push it a certain distance, then a little kink comes out of it. It's right here, which allows the next piece to slide into that kink. So there's a little, little gap because of the cutting off the tetrahedron, which allows the next piece to move. So that one moves into that little kink. And when that moves, that allows another one to move. And then finally, I was quite proud of this because the last piece is actually the biggest piece. So that is, it's the piece that when you're assembling it and try to see how to assemble it, you sort of use that big piece as the base and you see how the others fit around it. Because there are lots of false ways which don't fit. In fact, there are some ways which would fit, but you can't get there. I think there are th uh, three or four ways of doing it which would be a solution, except there's no way of getting them in that way. The one you can get in is the correct solution, and that depends on the locking mechanism, which is a key thing to it. As I say, you move the first piece, first when you're taking it apart, that is, so it's the last when you're putting it together. Um, so you move this first one sideways, and then that allows this gap to appear, so it allows the next one to move. That allows the same gap to appear, and the next one moves. 
and that one moves a long way, so it moves twice as far as the others because of the little bit bits inside which you can't see, but that allows the big one to come out. So the big one is the last piece you put in when you put it together, but it's sort of when you're putting it, trying to see how to put it together, it's the one you base it on when you, you see how do you fit the other ones, and there are lots of false tries, you see it doesn't actually, as I say there are I think there are four ways of doing it which you can't get into unless you had the fourth dimension to drop them in or something like that. <laughs> but you can't do it in ordinary space. Um, the only one you can do is this one. Now remember there was this particular spike on this piece here. I'd, I'd made it first in cardboard and there I had a second solution, there was a cook, what we call a cook, was a, a sol second solution which wasn't a, a, the right solution. And uh, I couldn't see how to get rid of the cook, so I made it out of cardboard, and then I could see that the way to do it was to make this little triangular corner piece here, and that just slips in at the last minute, there's a little gap, and I couldn't see how to do this without making my cardboard model, right in here. And that fits in there, and it fits in there, and I couldn't see without making my cardboard model that you could get rid of the cook this way. So it slips in there, and that enables you to fit the piece in, but it stops it from fitting in the wrong way. So that was part of the idea of that rather strange looking angular piece. Now it's always a little tricky to get it together because you have to hold everything in that awkward uh, disassembled arrangement. But as I say, the movements are basically all orthogonal, so they're sort of cubic directions. But they, they're sort of at odds with the tetrahedron shape, so you make use of that to allow you to have a puzzle which you couldn't make out of straight cubic pieces. It's uh, depends upon it being a tetrahedron, it's just essential. Frank Adams finally did it. It took him five hours, I believe. He told me it took him five hours <laughs> to do. Various other people sort of went the rounds about the mathematics students. See, these were all graduate students at that time. They became great professors afterwards at mathematics. Frank Adams was a professor at Cambridge. Um, Michael Atua, who was a very distinguished person, I didn't know that at the time, but he, he became very distinguished. All sorts of medals and prizes and things, he got pretty well everything you could imagine. And uh, he, I don't quite know how long it took him to do, he said it was a, co a comparable time. I suspect it was slightly longer than five hours, because he didn't admit to exactly how long it was, but it was about the same time. There was a record time for doing it, which was four and a half hours, which was a one of Frank Adams' friends who, who worked on in computing. He was a compu computer scientist rather than a mathematician. Okay, well, the job now is somehow to put it together. <laughs> and uh, the colors, I suppose, ought to be a help, but they're not a help to me because I can't really remember colors very well. But um, I might be able to do it, the things I do remember. I'm not quite sure what which way around that one goes. somewhat. So I can get that right. Okay, Let's see if that's right.
Yeah. There we go, eventually. 